I'm Deacon Kevin Malarkey, and this is the inaugural Forming Our Faith podcast. I'm not the inaugural Deacon Kevin, though. There are five Deacons Kevin in the Diocese of Tulsa, and all but one of them was ordained before me. I am, however, the only Deacon Kevin at St. Anne in Broken Arrow, and this is the only podcast that's being made on the campus of St. Anne. I'm the Director of Formation and Education at St. Anne and have been for the last two years. But please, don't confuse two years of experience with me always knowing what I'm doing. I'm very much learning as I go in this position, and part of that learning is, well, what I'm doing right now. When Bishop Condorla was appointed to Tulsa and began listening to the people of the diocese, he learned that the model of faith formation parishes, parishes used was an inadequate one. For children, religious education was done by volunteers, and you'd drop your kids off for an hour and they'd receive some lesson. For adults, parishes had speakers or programs organized, or not, here and there. But the result of all of these efforts done with noble intentions and by selfless and heroic people of God was uneven. So in his first pastoral letter to the people of Eastern Oklahoma, Bishop Condorla reclaimed an ancient model for transmitting the faith the domestic church. The basic idea of the domestic church is that the home is the first iteration, the first point of contact all of us have with the church Christ instituted. On the natural level, the home is where we first learn. So it makes sense that the home is the first place we learn on the supernatural level too. All this means that while the parish has a critical place in the formation of Catholics in the life of grace, the home is the primary place of that formation. If children are only learning about faith in the parish, they're not learning the faith. If adults are only being formed by periodic parish programs, they're not being formed. The domestic church is an ancient concept, and it's been the way the Catholics have been formed pretty much since the beginning. The broken model Bishop Condorla tried to correct has only showed up in our parishes in the last hundred years or so. The basic idea is that families daily form each other in the faith in their home. Families are a laboratory in which we learn how to love, how to forgive, how to be generous. Husbands and wives form each other. Parents form their children, and children in turn form their parents. Houses with extended family members see each member of the household formed by each other. It's beautiful. It's messy. It takes a lot of work and a lot of patience, and a lot of times, it probably seems like it's not going very well. But other times there are breakthroughs and moments when people sense that they've really gotten it right. Well, the domestic church is the exact same way. It's beautiful and messy, and it takes a lot of work and patience, and frequently it doesn't seem like it's going very well. And then there can be breakthroughs and moments when people really do get it right. In the aftermath of reintroducing and promoting the domestic church, one of the things we've come across is that while families want to do this, they don't quite think they know how to do it. The simple answer to families, and it's an answer that doesn't need a podcast and a studio and a Deacon Kevin, is to do with the faith what you do with everything else. Struggle and grow and plan and fail and try again. I think we're misled into thinking that because we're trying to grow in the faith, that it should be smooth and easy, and that there's a simple method, and if we just discover it, everything will be fine. That's not how it works naturally, so why would that be the way it works supernaturally? St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that grace perfects nature. Grace does not demolish nature or replace nature. All of that is a wordy way of saying that building the domestic church is hard work. And if you expect smooth sailing, those expressions need to be tempered and modified to fit reality. People really want to grow in holiness, and they really want to know more about their faith and their church. One of the big problems, I think, is not that people don't have that information accessible to them, but there's so much of it that it's hard to know where to start or how to know how to sift the good from the not so good or the bad. If you want to know more about the Catholic faith, you've got a thousand lifetimes worth of information that can be delivered to you in less than a second, and that's overwhelming. So what we're trying to do here at St. Anne, and what the church in Tulsa is trying to do, is to make all that information more digestible by packaging it into meaningful and palatable pieces.
We're also trying to deliver it in ways that make sense for how people function and how families work in 2023. Telling someone who's serious about learning more about the Catholic faith and who wants to be more integrally formed in that faith to just go and read a book isn't going to work in a lot of cases. But if you've got something you can listen to when you're in the car or at the gym or mowing the yard or whatever, well, maybe we're getting somewhere. And it's not like we're the first ones to go down this path. The popularity of Father Mike Schmitz's Bible in a Year and Catechism in a Year podcasts show that this is a format that's attractive to a lot of people. Here in Tulsa, Bishop Condorla's Tulsa Time podcast has been very well received, and it's worth your time to listen to as well. The formation team here at St. Anne are trying to take advantage of the format to give the people of our parish, our diocese, and even beyond something that helps them to grow in the faith and ultimately to love Jesus Christ and his church more. So that's the principal focus of this podcast. It's for the people of our parish, for the people of our diocese, and it's tailored to the experience of the church that we have here in Oklahoma. That's important to say right off the bat because I don't want anybody to be turned off when I describe things that aren't exactly that way in other places. Catholic means universal, after all, and the universe is a big place, and there are a lot of ways things can happen. What we're doing here in Broken Arrow is also being platformed by the Diocese of Tulsa, so we hope it's beneficial and useful to people throughout eastern Oklahoma and beyond. One of the pitfalls into which I've tumbled in my experience working here in the parish is to forget that there are people in other parishes who are trying to do the same thing I am and to forget to collaborate and consult with them. Our diocese is full of people who want to co-labor with Christ to cultivate the kingdom of God in eastern Oklahoma, and it's sometimes easy to forget that we're not just co-laboring with Christ, we're working with each other as well. The motto for, for forming our faith is one I've taken from Pope St. John Paul II, one that he spoke to audiences of young people at World Youth Day. Never ever settle for anything less than the heroism for which you were born. I've picked this motto because it's exactly what Bishop Condorla is asking Catholics in Eastern Oklahoma to do, to choose intentionally and deliberately to be disciples, knowing that this choice is an adventure. Adventures are scary and thrilling and painful and rewarding and arduous and exciting. They're never boring. The life of faith, the life of discipleship in Jesus Christ is an adventure. Our culture is awash in what passes for the heroic. We have an endless supply of movies that laud the actions of superheroes in the face of evil. We have celebrities and activists and influencers who suppose themselves to be heroes fighting against the injustices of whatever it is they're against. But what this culture gets wrong is that heroism is something not that we watch, not that something other people do. John Paul is telling us that we, you and I, were made for heroism. We were made to stand in the breach and fight against evil and injustice. We were made to live a life of adventure. And these aren't things that we can do. We were made for them. It's what we're here in this life to do. But, and here's the big difference between the counterfeits of our culture and the real deal John Paul was talking about. We were made for heroism because we share in the very life of Jesus Christ, he who is the hero. Our heroism isn't about us, it's about him and us. We're heroes when we go and do whatever we think is best. No. It's when we go and do the work of the Lord. Never ever settle for anything less than the heroism for which you were made doesn't mean that we're all supposed to be the stars of our own comic books, but that each of us chooses to make Jesus the star, to surrender our wills, which are flawed, to his, which is perfect. That means that we have to be formed in the faith of Jesus Christ so that we can know his will, so that we can do his will. This is the point of anything that can be rightly called Christian education, to do God's will. It's not to fill our heads with information, but to orient us towards our eternal goal. That's the motto of this podcast because it's what I hope this podcast can do, to remind you that you've been called to arms so that the kingdom of God can advance in this world. If you're a parishioner at St. Anne, you've probably noticed that the homilies I deliver are always written out. More than a few minutes into this maiden podcast, you've probably noticed the same here. 
I type my homilies because extemporaneous speaking for me is full of ticks and pauses and uh and um, and that can be distracting. I want to say things you need to hear, and that means I want to avoid saying things that you don't need to hear. The most successful podcasters, both in the Catholic world and in the broader atmosphere, are really bright people who are good at communicating naturally in ways that seem like they're simply speaking. I might get there someday, but in the words of Aragorn of Gondor in The Lord of the Rings, today is not that day. For the time being, forming our faith will have a script so that I can be sure I say exactly what needs to be said and leave what doesn't need to be said off. I'm absolutely open to doing an off-label series that's more organic and unscripted, that explores the depths of our Catholic faith in its more obscure and weirder aspects. There's a lot of weird stuff we do as Catholics, and if you're wondering about any of that weird stuff, well, let me know, and maybe I can do something about it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The Faith Formation Podcast is more formal and more intentional. It's going to take some time, maybe a lot of time, on those areas of our faith that distinguish and define us as Catholics. Because if I'm being honest, there are so many things in the church that seldom or never get explained. Things that are there for all to see, but can still be mysterious. Maybe trying to explain the stuff we take for granted can help you appreciate the meaning beyond. But I'm going for something more than just interesting. Everything the church does and everything the church believes is meant to bring us, you and me, into closer contact with Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the source of our hope. So the goal isn't just to tell you things that you might find interesting, but to see how Christ lays hidden in every corner of the church, in every letter of the Word of God, and in every lesson of the church's teaching, in everything the church says and does. He is both out in the open and waiting to be found. The first big topic forming our faith will cover is the Mass. Since I started here in the parish, when I'm talking with people and they volunteer what they want to know more about and to appreciate more, the number one thing they say is the Mass. That's why I'm starting with it, because that's what you know you need to know but maybe don't know. There are lots of reasons for this, but the big one is that the Mass doesn't explain itself by itself. It's shrouded in mystery, and mystery is mystery because it's not easily or readily explained. Mass is supposed to be mysterious. It's supposed to evade easy explanation. It's not like a chemical equation. It's like a work of art. It's not understood like a law of nature. It's beheld like a masterpiece because the mass is not a product of nature. It's the confluence of supernature with the elements of the natural world. Going to mass should be unlike anything else you do in your life because nowhere else in your life does heaven descend to earth to lift you up to heaven. There's another reason I'm starting with the mass and it's not an uplifting reason. In fact, it's because so many Catholics have refused to allow mass to uplift them. In 2019, the Pew Research Center's study about religious trends in the United States revealed that 69% of Americans who identify as Catholic do not believe that Jesus Christ is truly present in the Eucharist. So imagine the last time you went to Mass. If the Pew people are correct, for every three people at the Mass who believe that the Eucharist is Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity made present for us as food, there were seven people there who don't believe that. What those seven people do believe is probably all over the place, but those results are stunning. And you might think, well, there are lots of people who call themselves Catholic, but who seldom or never go to Mass. So what about those who attend Mass regularly? And you're right. People who attend Mass every week are more likely to believe what the Church believes, but not in the magnitude you might think. The Pew people figured out that among those who attended Mass weekly, 63% believed what the Church teaches about the Eucharist. That means that if every person at the last Mass you attended goes to Mass every week, for every two people who believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, there's one person who doesn't. And that person goes to Mass every week. When these statistics were published, the bishops of the United States knew they had to respond. The Eucharist isn't just something that we believe. It is, according to the Second Vatican Council, the source and summit of our Christian life. 
It's the beginning and the end of our faith, the Alpha and the Omega, because it is Christ, and that's what Christ is. And if people don't believe that, their faith is a house built on sand, or maybe something even flimsier than sand. Because they have the sacred obligation to shepherd the faithful, the bishops set about trying to shepherd us into a deeper appreciation for the Eucharist. So they began a multi-year Eucharistic revival in the United States. The gist of this revival is not principally to flood you with information about the Eucharist, as though the collapse in belief of Eucharistic faith is because people don't know what the Church teaches about the Eucharist. Eucharistic faith has collapsed because lots of Catholics know what the Church teaches and have rejected that teaching. So the heart of the revival is not formation of the mind, but formation of the heart. Before anything else, we need to pray that the Holy Spirit that descended on Jesus Christ at his baptism, that descended on the apostles and Our Lady at Pentecost, descend upon us and change us to form our hearts to receive Christ as he is in the Eucharist. So the primary work of the revival is not done by us. It's done by the Holy Spirit. And we're asking for the Spirit to work on us, on me and on you. That's a pretty bold thing to ask God to change me because I know there are parts of me that need to be reformed and refashioned. And God is a gentleman. He will never refuse an invitation. So if we're going to invite him into our lives and hearts in a new way, we have to be prepared for him to actually show up and even more for him to act like he owns the place because, you know, he does. Here's the prayer that's been written asking for this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it's one I'll pray because I think it's a perfect place to start. Lord Jesus Christ, you give us your flesh and blood for the life of the world, and you desire that all people come to the supper of the sacrifice of the Lamb. Renew in your church the truth, beauty, and goodness contained in the most blessed Eucharist. Jesus living in the Eucharist, come and live in me. Jesus healing in the Eucharist, come and heal me. Jesus sacrificing yourself in the Eucharist, come and suffer in me. Jesus rising in the Eucharist, come and rise to new life in me. Jesus loving in the Eucharist, come and love in me. Lord Jesus Christ, through the Paschal mystery of your death and resurrection, made present in every Holy Mass, pour out your healing love on your church and on our world. Grant that as we lift you up during this time of Eucharistic renewal, your Holy Spirit may draw all people to join us at this banquet of life. You live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mother of the Eucharist, pray for us. The Eucharistic revival during which we pray for this opening of our hearts formally goes until next summer. And during this podcast, I mean to take some time with the Mass to unpack and inspect and appreciate everything that's going on when we come together to worship God. So that's the first season, I guess you could call it, of forming our faith. And after that, well, we'll build that bridge when we come to it. The first thing I'll point out about the Mass isn't the first thing that happens or the first thing that gets said at the Mass because there's something that comes before all of that, and I'd be missing something massive if I didn't identify it. This is a thing that sticks out like a sore thumb, as my mom used to say, but which has become almost invisible to our eyes to the point that maybe we don't think about it much or even at all. And that's the building. The biggest material thing associated with the Mass is, quite paradoxically, the thing that we tend to think about the least. That's a huge problem because the church doesn't just teach us with words written in a book. It does, don't get me wrong. The Bible, of course, the catechism, writings of popes, canon law. But one of the grand things about being Catholic is that the faith is transmitted through all the senses, and everything we perceive has the ability to form us in the faith, even a building. So the church building should be a gospel in brick and stone and wood and glass. I wonder how many architects who construct Catholic churches understand this, that what they're doing isn't constructing something innovative or novel, but building a visible gospel. 
One of the reasons Catholic churches have been built to look like they do historically, whether it be Romanesque fortresses or soaring Gothic spires or Norman palaces, is that building the place you worship to look a certain way says something about the God you worship. If a church looks like a fortress or a castle, it's because God is our protector. If a church draws your eyes up because it's built on a majestic vertical scale, that's supposed to bring your smallness into contact with God's vastness. If a church was topped with a huge dome and inside that dome is a mosaic that depicts our Lord and our Lady and the angels and the saints, that's because you're being given a vision of heaven with its inhabitants. A church building isn't just a location for our worship, it's a public declaration of the God in whom we believe and what we believe about him. Remember when Notre Dame burned a few years ago? I know the French people felt the loss of Paris's cathedral as a kind of national wound, but so did lots and lots of Catholics who aren't French, as well as non-Catholics. And one of the reasons we felt the damage of that church so acutely is that even if we weren't able to verbalize it, its destruction signaled something that cannot be recovered. I don't just mean that something old fell into ruin and we can't resuscitate old things. I mean that we cannot reconstruct Notre Dame, even if we wanted to and had all the technology and resources to do so. Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, very shortly after the fire pledged that Notre Dame would be rebuilt in five years. That's a laughable statement. Firstly, because it took 800 years for Notre Dame to be built, and Macron had the hubris to say it could be rebuilt in five, but also because you can't rebuild a thing if you don't know how to build a thing. And we have no idea how Notre Dame was built. We like to think of ourselves as technologically sophisticated beyond any other generation or epoch in human history, but we cannot do what they did to build Notre Dame. And a large part of the reason is because we think we could build it in five years. The cornerstone for Notre Dame was set in 1163, but the work for the cathedral had been underway long before. And this work was not what we might think of when we think of building construction. Anticipating the amount of wood necessary for the roof, French lumberjacks cut down thousands of oak trees and seasoned them by submersing the wood in bogs. Each tree was submerged for about 30 years. And after those 30 years, the trees were removed and were allowed to dry for another 30 years. Then the cycle was repeated. That means that it took 120 years just for the materials that were used to hold up the roof to be prepared. Forget about actually using them to build the roof. Imagine the countless workers who toiled for four generations just to get the materials ready. Then imagine how such a proposal would be met today. Here at St. Anne, we've been trying to get a building built for five years and our patience is low. Imagine how it would be if we knew it would be another 115 years before we could even use the materials we're so eager to purchase. I remember some commentators saying that there aren't enough trees in all of Europe large enough to reconstruct Notre Dame's roof, and that if we planted the oak seedlings today that would be used in a reconstructed roof, they'd be large enough to use in the year 2250. Well, why do I bring all this up? Well, one reason is to point out how the greatest churches of Catholic history were built by a countless multitude of architects and builders and artisans and workers in absolute anonymity many knowing they'd never see the fruits of their labor, only because they wanted to glorify God through their work and enable others to glorify the God they loved, even if it was a thousand years later. Remember that the Catholic Church is the people of God, not just all over the world today, but throughout time, and that those French laborers toiled 900 years ago to give us something beautiful that brings us closer to God. They did it not because they want to be remembered, but because they want God to be remembered. Every church should do that. Every church should be a testament of faithful architects and masons and artisans who are doing this work for the glory of God. We want to give God the very best of what we have because God gave us the very best, himself given up for our redemption and our salvation. So we should want to build beautiful places for the mass to be celebrated. A church should be beautiful because God is the source of beauty and mass points us to God. I want to be careful here, because this is a point at which I, and probably some others, can get snobby and ridicule places that are 
in our estimation, excessively ugly. I used to teach a lesson about this to high school students, and after I showed them the grand and the majestic, I'd also show them the ugly. And to be sure, there are a lot of ugly churches in the Catholic world. But the point isn't that they're ugly because I say they are. They're ugly because they do not augment and enhance our worship because they are not gospels set in stone and terrazzo and wood and window. We glorify God in them, yes, but a beautiful church glorifies God too. So before we can even begin to talk about the Mass, it's important to say a little bit about where Mass takes place. To be a Catholic is to be immersed in a world of sights and smells and sounds that's meant to flood your mind and heart, and our church has much to flood you with. Statues, windows, paintings, bells, flowers, incense, music. There's a lot to see and smell and hear. Every Catholic church has things unique to itself that manifest the vision of the people who built it to glorify God and to edify God's people. Things meant to draw you more and more into this immersion of mind and heart. But every Catholic church also has some things in common with every other Catholic church. And today, I want to mention a few. And I start off with this because I want the next Mass you attend to be the best Mass you've ever attended, one during which you experience God's love in a new way and glorify God like you never have done before. That can begin with the building. I'm going to focus on two things today, the shape of the church and the images that are common to Catholic churches. It could be a cool series in the future to talk about those unique features in all the churches of our diocese and to bring the particulars of 78 parish churches and three mission churches to all the people of the diocese. But again, quoting Aragorn, today is not that day. For the last 1200 years or so, Catholic churches have typically, although of course not always, been built in the shape of a cross. This isn't because somebody 1200 years ago had the bright idea to build a church in the very same shape as the vehicle of our salvation. It's because the church instituted by Jesus is the vehicle of salvation. The church does what Jesus did, not just in Jesus's name, but as his mystical body. Christ is not just present in the church, he is the church. And what's more, you are the body of Christ because you are a member of the church. Where you are when you participate in mass isn't some arbitrary thing, it means something. And worshiping God from some point on the cross means that you're a part of the sacrifice Jesus makes of himself to the Father for the salvation of the world. A little history of the liturgy might help to illustrate this. If Mass was always celebrated according to the mindset of the ancient church, the bishop would always be presiding because the bishop is the pastor of the local church. The word the New Testament uses for bishop is episkopos and it means overseer. From where, we might ask, do you oversee things? Well, from your eyes, which are in your head. As the visible head of the church in his diocese, the bishop would stand and sit at the head of the assembly, which means that he's at the head of the cross. The clergy are ordained to assist the bishop in his shepherding of the diocese. So in a sense, priests and deacons are the hands of the bishop. So they should be where Christ's hands were on the cross, the arms of the cross. The Catholic faithful are seated in the part of the cross that has the rest of Christ's body on it, especially his feet. You are entrusted with the mission and the responsibility to go out into the larger world, into the world of your neighborhood and workplace and family, to, and to proclaim the good news you've received while you were at Mass. Yes, you cooperate with the bishop and with priests and with deacons through the works of mercy you do, but your position at Mass is meant to teach you something about yourself and your mission within the church. The position of the priest and the deacons and the bishop should teach you something about their mission as well. Now, obviously, this isn't the way we usually celebrate Mass. If you're interested in seeing Mass celebrated in the way kind of like what I just described, your best bet is to go to the Chrism Mass during Holy Week at the cathedral. There, all the priests of the diocese will gather around the bishop, as will a bunch of deacons. But most Sundays, we don't have the bishop and we don't have a group of priests or deacons. So this lesson about where you sit in the church and what it means doesn't always get taught. But it can be a powerful lesson nonetheless. If you are the feet of Christ, 
Where is God calling you to walk with those feet? I like the idea of the building itself as a part of the gospel we can experience with our eyes and hands and noses. If our faith is always just in our heads, a bunch of ideas, we forget that just as we can't experience the world just in our heads, we can't experience the church that way either. We have bodies, and our bodies are the primary means through which we come to know about the world. They're also the primary means through which we come to know about the next world. And this is a really important point I think a lot of us either miss or distort. So many times when somebody we love dies, we find comfort in the idea that their soul is in heaven. But we knew that person when they were alive was alive only when their soul was united with their body. The separation of the soul from the body is the Christian theological definition of death. After that happens, most of us, myself included, are very uncomfortable with the idea that a person's soul detached from their body lingers on earth, but we're not uncomfortable with the idea that their soul detached from their body goes to heaven. It's curious. If being alive on earth is body and soul, being alive, fully alive in heaven is body and soul too. This is one of the things we believe about the eternality of heaven. It's not just our soul, but body and soul. Every so often I'll hear at a funeral or read on a social media post about somebody who's died, especially if it's a young person, that heaven has gained another angel. I never say or write this, but respectfully, no. No, it hasn't. Angels are spirits without bodies, but the person who died had a body, and that means something. Jesus Christ has a body, and that means something in the story of salvation. Sometime down the line, we'll cover death and eternity, but I want to make it clear right now that the Catholic understanding of things, the body, the material substance of our existence, matters. I wasn't born in Oklahoma. I moved here when I was 23 years old. My formative years were spent outside of Philadelphia, where a higher percentage of the population was Catholic. Many of the suspicions and accusations non-Catholic Christians have about the Catholic Church simply weren't a part of my upbringing. But for many of you who grew up here, you probably knew about this much earlier than I did. I learned about all of this as an adult, that the presence of statues and icons and paintings in Catholic churches is interpreted by some Protestants as idolatry. Many of our neighbors here in Oklahoma are supremely uncomfortable with what we have in our church because there are icons and statues and paintings, mosaics and reliefs. This podcast is not principally intended to be apologetical. The point isn't to equip you with the tools used to explain and defend the faith to those who don't share that faith with us. Apologetics is an important branch of the formation tree, but it's not exactly what we're doing here. Apologetics is directed to those outside the church. Faith formation is directed to you who are already within the church. Faith formation sort of precedes apologetics. And you can certainly take what's presented here and use it for apologetics. But just like faith formation isn't just about information, neither is apologetics. There are techniques to effective argumentation, and people with wonderful ideas can be lousy in conveying them. People with awful ideas can be marvelously successful in conveying them too, and they're the ones to watch out for. We're massively fortunate here in the Diocese of Tulsa to have Carlo Broussard in residence in our diocese. He's one of the most well-regarded Catholic apologists in the English-speaking world, and he and his family have recently moved to Tulsa. He'll be sharing his work with the people of the diocese, so if he's doing something at your parish or a parish near you, go. He's speaking at the Faith Formation Conference in just a few weeks in Tulsa and is lined up for events and programs at a bunch of parishes. Definitely check him out. He's got both the explanations of why we believe what we believe, but also how to show people who don't believe what we believe why what we believe is in keeping with what God has revealed to the church. Archaeology done in the earliest places where Christians celebrated mass, like in the Roman catacombs or house churches that have been excavated, have confirmed that images have been present in Christian worship since the beginning of the church, at least in some form. And again, this isn't just because some Catholic 1900 years ago decided it would be a nice idea to paint the catacomb walls with images of Jesus because paint looks nicer than bare earth. Images of our Lord 
were used because he had a body, and that matters. For some reason, I think about this when I'm in church and I look at my hands. Very frequently, it occurs to me that Jesus Christ had fingernails. Jesus Christ had calluses on his palms. He had tendons underneath his skin. He had skin. For the, me, the materiality, the physicality of the incarnation is like the flipping of a light switch that bathes the darkness of my mind with new light and enables me to see what's been hidden. And in those moments, it makes perfect sense to me that we'd want to be able to see Jesus as he was in the incarnation. Church history also teaches us that there have long been those uncomfortable with the presence of images in two or three dimensions or both in Catholic worship. The very existence of images makes some people jittery, and not without reason. It's in the book of Exodus, after all, that Israel should not make a carved image that is worshipped. And the reservation is entirely appropriate. If we're worshipping the image itself and not the God who is depicted in the image, that's a problem. This difference between bowing to the image in so itself and bowing to God, who is imaged, is the difference between an idol and an icon. An idol is understood to be the god. The god is the object itself. An icon, though, is different. An icon is a sort of window into heaven. The church's understanding of these images, according to Dr. James Hitchcock, who's a history professor at St. Louis University, is that icons are a way of making heaven concretely imaginable through the images of its inhabitants. So the gist here is that holy images in the church are meant to make it easier for us to imagine that at Mass, we are in heaven. It's not just that we are reminded of heaven, it's that we are transported there. That's where Jesus and Our Lady and the saints are. Seeing them while we worship God clues us into the fact that we're doing the exact same thing in time that they're doing for all eternity. They had bodies. And it's part of the creed we profess that at the end of time, our bodies will rejoin our souls. And just as earthly life is body and soul, so too is heavenly life. So we have paintings and statues and icons of holy men and women because their holiness wasn't just an idea. It was actually lived in the world of flesh and bone. They cooperated with grace in their bodies. And so they'll be glorified in their bodies. Jesus and Mary already are. When it comes to images in church, there are usually quite a few, and with so many can come a kind of visual overload that causes you to miss them all. I think this happens because we're constantly bombarded with images of everything from breakfast cereals to automobiles to jet skis to saints. And because our eyes are always under assault this way, our eyes learn to see without seeing, and we end up beholding everything and seeing nothing. Visually immersive churches harken back to a time when the paintings or mosaics or statues in church would be the only hand-created images you'd ever see, and their beauty and otherworldliness would stand out so much more. But if you've just watched an hour of television, you've seen images of probably dozens of human beings and lots of animals or landscapes or visually appealing products for sale, and that statue in church might not be so captivating anymore. The most obvious image in any Catholic church should be the grand crucifix that frames the sanctuary. And again, there are protests from other Christians. Jesus rose from the dead. Why do you show him as dead? And that's a worthwhile point. The heart of our faith as Catholics and as Christians is that Jesus died and in dying defeated death and rose from the dead by his own power. That's the gospel. But in every Catholic church in the world, there should be a crucifix it should be big, and it should be behind the altar, and it should depict Christ in his passion. The reason is that we understand the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and the sacrifice of the Mass to be the exact same sacrifice. Jesus died on the cross almost 2,000 years ago, and that same sacrifice of his life given up for the forgiveness of sins is being made present here and now in this church at this Mass. The Mass is not a new sacrifice in which Christ dies again. It is the new and definitive sacrifice of Calvary that puts an end to all of the old sacrifices of the Jerusalem temple. At Mass, through the work of the Holy Spirit, heaven condescends to earth and time meets with eternity. 
we are given by God's free gift the same presence that was on the cross. We'll talk a lot more about this when we get into the Eucharist in a few weeks, and especially the Eucharistic prayer. But for now, the presence of the crucifix is a powerful reminder of what's happening at Mass. What we see up there on the wall is being made present down here on the altar. The Catholic artistic sensibility has always tended towards the realistic when depicting our Lord or the holy men and women who are in heaven. When we're making images for use in the church, they look as much as the artist is able to replicate as humans actually are. Think of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Michelangelo spent years learning the intricacies of human anatomy so he could depict them as realistically as possible in his sculptures and frescoes. Catholic art for most of church history finds abstraction to be undesirable. This is one of the reasons Catholic artists were behind the realistic artistic movement. Their imaginations were formed by the Catholic faith, and depicting the images of that faith for them was the most natural thing in the world. In some places, this desire for realism can strike us, at least some of us, as grotesque. There are some crucifixes that show Christ's body in a state of agonizing torture because that's how it really would have been. The desire for realism isn't just for the human form as it is, but for the circumstances of that human form as it was. This hyperrealism came to be a defining feature of religious art, especially in Spain, in the 14th and 15th and 16th centuries. And since many places in our hemisphere were Spanish colonies, that influence was brought to our part of the world. The other two images typical in every Catholic church are those of Mary, the mother of God, and of St. Joseph, Jesus's earthly foster father. We'll spend a lot of time talking about Mary and the saints after we finish this series on the Mass, because I, I know Our Lady especially can be a thorny issue for some Christians who aren't Catholic. But I don't want to get into those issues now. What I want to make is a suggestion about what the Church is trying to teach us by the placement of three images within the confines of the Church. Christ on the cross, the Blessed Mother, and St. Joseph. And this is something I think that can revolutionize the way we come to Mass and participate in the Mass. Statues or images of Mary are, almost without exception, depictions of solemn serenity. Mary usually isn't shown with a smile on her face, so we can't call her jovial, but instead with a look that's both peaceful and serious. And it's likewise with St. Joseph. He who spoke no words in scripture is a picture of quiet strength. So Mary and Joseph appear to our eyes with a kind of tranquility. But Jesus is depicted not in solemn serenity, not in serious peace with quiet strength, not with tranquility, but in his death. Our Lord is shown in image as dead. This is more significant than I think we realize. Remember that the church is supposed to be a sort of image of heaven, and that populating this image of heaven with heaven's inhabitants reinforces the image. Seeing Mary and Joseph in tranquility and very much alive reminds us that they are very much alive in heaven, more alive than we are in our earthly lives. This is at the heart of what we believe about the saints, that they live. And they live the abundance of life Jesus came to provide. The way Jesus provided it, though, is by his death. Seeing Mary and Joseph alive and Jesus dead is a powerful symbol. It tells us that Jesus' death is what defeats death, and if we have any hope of life after death, it's only through him, and with him, and in him. It was his death that broke the power of death. The Catholic bishops here in the United States say it this way, The cross with the image of Christ crucified is a reminder of Christ's paschal mystery, his passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. It draws us into the mystery of suffering and makes tangible our belief that our suffering, when united with the passion and death of Christ, leads to redemption. And this isn't to downplay the resurrection. Literally, everything in the church broadcasts the power of resurrection. The saints depicted as fully alive, candles that dance, blooming flowers, the living, breathing people of God. Christ is shown in his death because he's the only one with the power to lay down his life and take it up again. It's to remind us that if we want to live in Christ, we must die with Christ. And if we want to find our lives, we have to lose them. If we wish to follow him to where he is, we must deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow him. 
This is probably a good place to stop this first episode of Forming Our Faith. I'm obviously still new at this, and I've been advised to simply say what needs to be said instead of trying to fill up a certain number of minutes. Next time, I'll look at a few more of the things common to the church building, remembering that they all have something to teach us about loving, serving, and following our Lord. And eventually, I promise, we'll get to the Mass itself. I invite you to leave comments and ask questions if you have them. If you like this, subscribe to stay linked to future episodes. And finally, remember, in the words of Pope St. John Paul II, never, ever settle for anything less than the heroism for which you were born.